Hey there, guys. Welcome to our dual commentary of Assassin's Creed 2. This is part three. And I am joined by my friend Pickal right here. It's me again. The rain has healing energy. <laughs> That's a Xenoblade reference if you don't know. No, it's not. Oh, it's not? Okay. <laughs> I guess not. Stupid TikTok. <laughs> but um, it has been a while since we have actually done this duo commentary for Assassin's Creed 2 because we have been busy with other projects, we've been busy with work, we've been busy with other crap. But I've managed to record a, a portion of this to actually do for commentary. And originally for parts 1 and 2, we did live commentary where I was actively uh, playing the game while we were busy talking. I wasn't a big fan of that format. And I think the time that Pakal and I spent uh, recording uh, AC1 dual commentary has maybe had a greater respect for uh, doing commentary for pre-recorded videos. So all of this is, has already been recorded, but we'll be just be uh, doing the commentary for here. So uh, yeah, that'll be great. And we can actually lay out our thoughts better. I can actually do some editing a lot better. And believe it or not, this is all recorded directly off of uh, Share Factory. So on PS5, when you go into Share Factory and you have clips on your uh, track one, if you go into full screen mode, it doesn't disable your ability to record, unlike PS4, which is really cool. So I'm going to be able to showcase the full screen and not have to resort to other methods. Yeah. Or yeah. you could just be me and buy a fucking Elgato. Yeah, but with Elgato, I'd have to be on, like, PS3 or something. Because I don't really see the need for Elgato for PS4 and PS5, unless it's for recording block scenes. If you have seen my uh, Bop and Arkham Knight walkthrough, I did actually find a way to record block scenes using remote play, which was pretty cool. But I don't see myself using that for a, a lot of games, so th hopefully I won't have to be the case. But anyway, uh, to talk about what's happening right now, we are at the point where uh, Ezio is heading to... Uh, Monteregioni to unite with uh, Mario because he knew about this villa. And Vieri has cut us off, which... How did Vieri actually know where Ezio was going? Probably because he followed him out of the city, I don't fucking know. <laughs> but he's right in front of him, though. That's a little confusing. It's called fucking following people with stealth and getting in front of them. Yeah, just like an assassin. But hey, he's a Templar. That's not supposed to be the case. Listen. In Assassin's Creed Rogue, you play as a Templar, but it's just an assassin. <laughs> I guess that's a fair assessment. Templar skin. <laughs> yeah. But it's great to actually um, come back to this game after so long, because I love Assassin's Creed 2 very much. The fucking Dawn of Ragnarok shit for Valhalla came out like a few days ago, and I haven't played it because I don't fucking care. Me but neither. I still see ads for it. I'm seeing ads for it on like Instagram and like Twitter and shit, and even like... People who are like, oh, I liked Odyssey and Origins stuff. Even those people are like, this is not Assassin's Creed anymore. Like, yeah, I know. I've seen a couple of videos related to that. It's insane. Just how many people are so against Ubisoft. Do you want to know the confusing part? They're voicing these thoughts now when Dawn of Ragnarok released, yet they weren't saying the same thing with Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Because they're fucking stupid. I mean, like, when you when you look at, um, like, the mythological elements of Assassin's Creed Odyssey or the Fate of Atlantis DLC and the way it portrays the Isu and all these other uh, mythological creatures, and they're trying to explain it out of, oh, and a piece of Eden did this, a piece of Eden did that. God, that is not Assassin's Creed. I guess it's good that they're saying it now, but, like, also it's, like, way too fucking late. Because, like, you're so behind seeing how fucking stupid Ubisoft is. I know, it's really, really ridiculous, and I'm almost half tempted to do like a side-by-side -side video and just title it How are these two games part of the same series? And one side would be Revelations, and then the other game would be Odyssey, and I would just have uh, some scenes from Revelations, and then that one scene in Assassin's Creed Odyssey in the Fate of Atlantis DLC, where um, Cassandra is dealing with the Hecaton Kires. Yeah, like, I remember when, like, Valhalla first got, like, revealed and there was, like, the first trailer. Like, I remember Lasers and, like, uh, probably also a few other people, they literally said that, like, you couldn't even tell. If you didn't know it was Assassin's Creed beforehand, you couldn't even tell it was Assassin's Creed until the end when he had the Hidden Blade. <laughs> no kidding. It looked nothing like Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I think this is mainly the same case with the, uh, the first trailer that released the first uh, cinematic trailer for Valhalla. But it's the same case with uh, Dawn of Ragnarok as well. And I'm not gonna play it because I don't want to fucking give Ubisoft my money and I don't care. 
Yeah. Also, uh, by the way, um, because I had to re-record uh, this whole sequence again for the purposes of doing this particular format for commentary, uh, I might have missed out on a couple of things that I did pick up previously in the first parts of this uh, dual commentary. Um, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I mean, I, I think I missed out on a couple of codex pages that I probably picked up in the first two parts, but we can just get to them at some later point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not that hard to find. Like, I, like this mission that we're gonna do later, where we like get the codex pages in Montero and Yoji. I don't. I completely fucking broke. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I said, but like, I literally memorized all the locations of the codex pages in that mission because I'm just that much of a nerd. <laughs> You'd be even more of a nerd if you memorized all the feather locations. I memorized some of them. <laughs> yeah, because I, I've never picked up all of the feathers, even on the PS3 version of Assassin's Creed 2 like almost no point to do it because like 100 percenting any assassin's creed game like even the newer ones like it literally gives you nothing hmm. i thought there were um didn't assassin's creed brotherhood give you a trophy for 100 percent synchronization well like trophies is like all you get you don't get anything in game i mean technically you are getting like side memories and the like when you're synchronizing with that seal a lot more i would say even after you complete all the side memories you don't get anything who cares? You get to play through uh, an amazing side mission and just get, get um, Ezio's character fleshed out. That's all the reward I need. Yeah, but like even other games that released in like 2010, you got stuff for like doing 100%. Yeah. And um, speaking of which, I actually uh, was playing an old game from Ubisoft. It was a game I've had for a while, but I only had the urge to go back to it after watching uh, footage of some unreleased game that's of the same series. But I was recently playing uh, Prince of Persia, The Forgotten Sands, and the parkour on that game is amazing. It's the best parkour I've ever seen in a game by far. I'm sure there are better parkour systems, but of all the games I've played, the parkour in Prince of Persia, The Forgotten Sands is a lot more functional than the parkour system in Assassin's Creed, at least for the newer entries. But even the older games have those flaws, but I don't see any flaws with the parkour system in Prince of Persia. I mean, there have been those small moments, but the parkour is amazing. And I'm almost half tempted to get the remake of Prince of Persia. Uh, it's the very first um, Prince of Persia game that they're remaking, which can you even call the remake? It's, it feels more like a remaster. Like, And somehow they still haven't remastered AC1. Yeah, it's that is so confusing, and the, the the whole idea of them just remastering Prince of Persia, but they're calling it a remake when Resident Evil 2 Remake set a new standard for remakes, even though Resident Evil 2 Remake is a shit game. That right there is not forgivable at all on Ubisoft's part. He's fucking greedy and wants to fucking money. That's why they're selling Dawn of Ragnarok for like forty dollars and not including it as part of the season pass. Yeah, and that's why they're they're just half-assing their animations and the like. So many people that are so mad about that. Yeah, have you even have you seen a bit of footage of Donna Ragnarok? Yeah, and it looks like shit. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, I, that's as I expected as such. I mean, it's disappointing that a series that started off so high could fall so low. You know. Yeah, like. Like, the areas in, like, Dawn of Ragnarok, it's literally just the map of Valhalla, but, like, more red. <laughs> yeah, reused assets, this and that. It's just, like, England, but it has lava. That is very, very disappointing. Oh, and also, by the way, when I was recording all this, I was not playing with audio. I didn't have my headphones on because I was listening to uh, another TV show while I was doing this. But, um... It was no problem whatsoever. I think you can do a lot of the Assassin's Creed games without using any audio, but I can't imagine why we'd ever want to ignore the fantastic soundtrack and amazing voice acting of these uh, games. When I was 100%ing Odyssey, I fucking turned off the audio and <laughs> did, just listened to podcasts all the time. Yeah. Also, did you see that just then? I managed to pickpocket the guy. I got three florins from him. What the fuck? Yeah, I don't know how I did that. We're in combat right now. And also, you can pickpocket this guy multiple times when you um when you transition between each of these uh, sequences. Well, it's probably because the game treats them as, like, a separate enemy. Yeah, basically. But you're basically hearing uh, Ezio talk about uh, the things he's learned from the library right here with Assassins and Templars. Like, back when Ubisoft actually cared about their lore. This was, like, even before Darby McDevitt. Yeah, it's before Darby McDevitt as well. Yeah, I think Darby joined on, like, AC4? Mm. AC4 was his first one? No, he wrote, he wrote Revelations, though. Oh, shit. You're right. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Revelations is exceptional with its storytelling. It's absolutely he amazing. Did AC4 and Origins and Valhalla. He did Origins. I thought it was someone else. He did Origins. It was not Origins that he was the lead writer on. It was Valhalla. Well, he still did Valhalla, and but Valhalla is also still bad. Yeah, and all that character growth that Avar had from the beginning all the way to the end is completely lost. For some reason, after he left Ubisoft, he also came back for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, that how, is that even like, possible to do? Like, leave a company and then immediately go back to it? I mean, he did it, so clearly. I don't know how that's even possible. I, I don't even know why he decided to go back, because the series is dead anyway. Even if he stayed and didn't even leave in the first place, the series would be dead even with him on it. Knowing him, he probably just had a lot of guilt when leaving Ubisoft, and then That's he's actually- Yeah. Because, like, every- when he left, like, everyone was, like, so fucking sad that, like, he left, because, like, everyone was saying, like, oh, Assassin's Creed is gonna be dead now, even though it's been dead for fucking years. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely disappointing. What is there to actually talk about? I mean, I guess with regards to Marvel stuff, uh, there was mention about uh, new shows like Moon Knight and the like. Yeah. But um, what do you think of Moon Knight? Just for your initial impressions. It kind of looks cool. I like that they're going to like supernatural shit. Eh, I don't know. I think the supernatural trope is just a, a thing that's used way too much in media. And at times it's just a little too off-putting, if you ask me. I mean, I'm, I also listen to podcasts about, like, demons and shit, so that's probably why I'm more interested. Yeah. I guess I have to thank uh, game series like Silent Hill and all these other survival horror games that are just all about the supernatural aspects that just take that li very lazy approach to actually, like, give me this whole perspective on supernatural elements. The supernatural stuff, what do you think, like, Assassin's Creed will actually go into that domain? I mean, they explored, like, mythological aspects and they gave them form. What's to say they won't do supernatural stuff as well with ghosts and the shit? The thing is, is they kind of did that, though, with Brotherhood, but they actually made it make sense because it was all the result of the bleeding effect. And it wasn't something that was so obtrusive, this and that. But what, what do you bet they're going to embrace, like, specters and the like that are just going to attack the player later on if they're going to be so heavily invested with this mythological garbage. Imagine there's a game that's set in Scotland and then you get to fucking ride the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> I would definitely expect them to do that for Assassin's Creed. I really would. It's fucking stupid. Yeah. Like there's a game set in West Virginia and you get to meet Mothman as a historical character. You know what I did though recently? I fucking pirated the Uncharted movie. You watched it? Yeah. I pirated it. I pirated it off a website because I didn't care, but I watched it anyway. Well, um, okay, because I was going to actually watch it with you, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting that you managed to pirate it. But did you like it? I feel like it was better than I thought it would be. Huh. I still don't really, like, Mark Wahlberg is silly. I, I still don't feel like he fits, but, like, after giving the movie a chance, I feel like Tom Holland can actually pull off a pretty good Nathan Drake. I don't know the person who played Chloe, but, like, she was good too, I guess. Hmm. But you think it's definitely worth uh, watching? Yeah. I feel like it's better than it, like, it's, it's better than it should be. Well, it's better than the Assassin's Creed movie, that's for sure. Well, because they actually tried. Yeah, but would you say it's like the best video game movie you've ever seen? Fuck no. No? What's the best video game movie you've seen? I don't even know. They're all bad. Yeah. The only ones I've seen are the Assassin's Creed one, Uncharted, and the Sonic one. I mean, the one I've actually seen is Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia was pretty decent. I didn't even know there was a Prince of Persia movie. Yeah, there is. I think there's like two Street Fighter movies and like some Resident Evil movies. Oh, the, the Resident Evil- oh, no, 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 the Resident Evil movies are the best. The animated ones are phenomenal. The live-action ones can go die in a hole. Oh, no. Yeah, because they, they've ruined Resident Evil with those live-action movies, but the animated ones are phenomenal. Minus, uh, Infinite Darkness. I do not like Infinite Darkness as a TV series. It was very average and throwaway, and it was serving no purpose. They, they placed the timeline of those, uh, episodes like, before the events of Resident Evil 5. What's the point of that? What what are you setting up when we already know what happens after Resident Evil 5? That's what I mean when I say it's a throwaway story. And then some parts with the mutations didn't make any sense. The characters were just throwaway. Yeah. 
that's why I didn't like want to watch the Uncharted movie at first because I thought I heard somewhere that it was going to be a prequel to the games, even though it was contradicting the game's lore. Are they still considering it canon? Uh, I don't know what they're doing with it because I don't think it's like a prequel. I think it's like its own thing because like the Sonic movie isn't part of the Sonic canon. Hmm. But um, based on what you watch, it definitely seems like it's not canon to the main story. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they tell their own origin story of Nathan. They still also try to, like, follow the games. Like, he still has Sam. They're still in the orphanage. Like, Sam still leaves. Well, I'm definitely intrigued. Uh, don't, don't spoil the movie uh, any further. I'll yeah. definitely give it a try. But, um, yeah, I guess I have another movie I will look forward to. But right now we're infiltrating uh, San Gimignano and we're trying to take on Vieri. And these archers here are very broken because for whatever reason, when you're on a rooftop and you throw a throwing knife at archers, they know exactly where you are and just spot you. The archers on this game overall are very broken because not only do they have the ability to hear your footstep noises from about three meters away, but they also have the ability to uh, respawn indefinitely if you do a certain glitch. And also, um, when you get close to archers and they drop their bows in order to use their swords, if you lose that guy entirely, like he loses you, another archer just respawns in this place, like right next to him. The programming on the archers is definitely uh, one of the weirdest parts of Assassin's Creed 2 by far. They can just like see you from anywhere. Yeah. And th then their ability to just hear things that they shouldn't be able to hear, like the throwing knives, is absurd. That's why I don't even like use throwing knives in Ezio games, because like they they just get you alerted every time, and like most of like the later game enemies with more armor don't even die in one hit. Mm, at least in uh, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, the brutes died in one hit from the charge to ring knives, and throwing knives you can actually throw multiples of them in uh, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, which is cool. Yeah, but like I also don't even like using the charge throwing knife attack. It's like even when I even when the enemies are like right in front of me, some of them still miss. Like, somehow they still miss even when they're right in front of me, and it's so stupid. Well, that's the classic Ubisoft trope of oh, working when it wants to and not working when it's supposed to. That's just that classic seal of uh, approval from Ubisoft with mechanics. It basically oh, I shouldn't have uh, I shouldn't have killed this guy so soon because there was dialogue, but I was just in a rush basically. But that dialogue is not even, like, that long, anyway. I suppose. Well, yeah, basically talking about Vieri being paranoid and the like. As with every single member of the Pazzi family, it seems. The pizza family. Yeah. And also, um, I forgot to mention, uh, in the earlier parts, because... In the first part of Assassin's Creed 2 Dual Commentary, uh, Picol had mentioned that... Uh, Vieri was voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, and I asked him the question of uh, why is that name so familiar? And he mentioned that uh, Yuri Lowenthal was the guy that voiced Spider Man in Marvel Spider Man. Spider Man wasn't the first thing that came to mind. It turns out that um, Yuri Lowenthal is the same guy that voiced uh, Ben in Ben 10, and that's why that voice was so uh, familiar to me, because he voices the main character of Ben 10. And yeah, that was very surprising when I heard that. But, um,. Yeah, we're about to head over to Vieri in a moment, and you'll be seeing a uh, powerful trick in Assassin's Creed 2, and this also exists in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood and Revelations. But whenever the enemies are transitioning from different planes, like for instance, they're climbing up a wall, or for instance, they jump from one rooftop to another and you hit them in the air, um, whenever they are transitioning from a wall onto the flat surface of a rooftop, or they are hit in midair, by a sword, for instance, they die instantly. There's something that happens uh, with the programming whenever the enemies are shifting planes that just causes them to actually die when you hit them with certain weapons, which is something I figured out on accident a long time ago, and I do not remember how I figured it out. It's very handy to actually um, kill the enemies very quickly using this method. And this is one of the main charms of the Ezio trilogy, when you're indulging in a combat system that the game wasn't intended for, and it's a hidden mechanic, and I almost get the impression that Ubisoft wanted you to discover this mechanic, because engaging in the normal combat is time-consuming, but using the method that I just discussed, you can end enemies so quickly. And then the ability to um, knock enemies off of rooftops by standing in specific locations is very helpful as well. And you'll be seeing a couple of these uh, methods later on when I demonstrate them. And it, it's so much better than when in the fucking newer games, you can't even, like, hit someone who's, like, two feet below you. Yeah. But uh, there is going to be a bit of a hassle right here, because 
as you can see, I stumbled into that guy, so my movement was slowed. He was able to get some hits out on me. Yeah, lots of moments in this part where the enemies are still knocking me to death. And also, for whatever reason, uh, Vieri lost me right over here. He was not trying to follow me. I wish you could climb around the back and just, like, ledge assassinate him. Because yep. I'm pretty sure you have ledge assassinate by this point, but, like, I've tried... No, you don't. Times and the game doesn't let you. you. You don't have ledge assassinations yeah. at this point. Well, well, like, you still can't, like, assassinate him from the back, even if you climb up. Because even if you climb up behind him, he still detects you. <laughs> I suppose. And also, for some reason, he doesn't take fall damage. If you knock him off and he just falls to the ground, he doesn't take fall damage, which is bizarre. Probably because the game, like, treats him as, like, the first boss, so you meant to, like, kill him, like, in a normal way. But watch that, you see that? That's what I mean when I say he was transitioning between planes, he was going from a vertical plane to a horizontal plane, and during that brief period, because I hit him with my sword, he died instantly. It's because Etsy was a god. Yeah. But this right here is one of the most uh, powerful scenes in Assassin's Creed 2, and this is what separates the uh, Assassins from the Templars. But as you see right here, um, Ezio is cursing Vieri to death, and this is when uh, Mario actually um, advises against uh, his actions, and he's saying, here, you are not Vieri, do not become him. And this is something that greatly separates the assassins from the Templars on a more humane level, where even in death, they still um, allow their enemies to rest in peace. And this is basically one of the first steps to ensuring mankind actually evolves, when they're not acting like monsters. Because, of course, the Templars don't seek evolution in humanity. They want to confine humanity to uh, a separate part of the world in order to uh, assume control, basically. And I think it's one of the most uh, impressive scenes in Assassin's Creed 2 by far. Even uh, Laser Z agrees. Because Ezio's the fucking best. There's a reason why every new game just reuses Ezio's theme as the main theme of the new game. I mean, they didn't do so with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, though. Well, there's still like a Valhalla version of the Ezio theme, and it's still like in some songs. Never actually heard it, but I wouldn't know because I only played Assassin's Creed Valhalla once. I don't even, like, remember where it is. Hmm. I feel like it might be one of your, like, synchronizing viewpoints or something, but I don't fucking remember, and I don't really want to remember, because I don't care. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised um, Ubisoft hasn't announced their next Assassin's Creed game yet. Because they're waiting. Well, they shouldn't I be waiting, they though. They did announce it, because for some reason they're making, like, some game based around Basim. Like, it was meant to be, like, a side DLC for Valhalla, but then it got so big that they decided to just make it its own game. With Basim, um, I guess that makes sense. They're still, like, selling, like, a side DLC for Valhalla as a full game for, like, $60. Any idea if it's about as expensive as the Lost Legacy content from Unch Uncharted? I don't even know, and I don't care. Oh, yeah, why, why am I even asking that question? They're also making a game based around the Notre Dame fire. Remember when Notre Dame was on fire a few years ago? Yeah. They're making a game based around that. Really? It's like a first-person firefighter game. It was like VR something. I don't even know. <laughs> a VR firefighter game. Hmm. Yeah, like I don't, I don't even know, and it's so stupid. Yeah. Why are they monetizing the Notre Dame being on fire? Because uh, Ubisoft's uh, construction of uh, Notre Dame in uh, Assassin's Creed Unity was actually helpful in allowing them to rebuild Notre Dame, and I guess they're trying to ride that hype by just uh, monetizing it. What though? <laughs> That's fucking stupid. Yeah, but I, I do admit that is pretty impressive, that uh, their one-to-one -one reconstruction of uh, Notre Dame had actually helped uh, rebuild uh, Notre Dame. That is yeah, impressive. If spend, like, four years making the intelligent the entire Notre Dame one to one maybe Unity could have been a better game. I don't know. I mean, like, if they took time, if they actually took time, that'd be different, you know? They made the whole Caribbean for AC4 and, like, like half of Egypt for uh, for Origins, and they didn't make that one-to-one. -one. They just wanted to put a lot of characters, like, Ubisoft is a French company, I guess. They're also a stupid company. Mm. Yeah, but I still feel like um, they could still make Unity a, a great game, even if, like, everything is one-to-one. -one. It's just... I'm guessing uh, the developers didn't really care, and you know, like even when you put a lot of uh, care and dedication into a game, it's still gonna come out pretty shit. I mean, look at look at Resident Evil Village. I mean, I've gone on and on about so many problems with Resident Evil Village's development team to the point where I would honestly consider 
Resident Evil Village's development team to be the dumbest and most deluded development team ever for the entire Resident Evil series. And they spent years developing that game. So you can't really say that if they made uh, Notre Dame not one-to-one, they would actually make Unity a better game. I mean, it's not as simple a process as that, you know? They could have used the time and money somewhere else. Yeah, but I mean, we, we don't know exactly how uh, game development works, though. I mean, I know a bit about it, but I mean, they could probably still make one-to-one environments and not impact the story. I mean, it's managed by a different team, though. I mean, like, the, the story writers are are separate team compared to the people actually creating the structures. Well, like, like, not even, like, a better game just in terms of the story. They could They could have made the game way less glitchy and, like, it made, like, the city a better, like, place to be in and it could have made the parkour better and not as bad yeah but i mean that's all dependent upon the underlying issues present at the company at the time i guess because maybe uh, the reason why they rushed unity out the door was because the money hungry uh, executives just wanted to uh, get money out the door very quickly and this impacted the the uh, developers' abilities to iron out Unity, because that's just that's unfortunately the case with a lot of games. Because uh, the publishers, they push the uh, developers to new extremes of stress, and that's what causes them to rush games out the door. And what you're saying right now, Pakal, about like not releasing a broken game, like I agree with you that morally it makes sense to not release a broken game. But the reality of the situation is. Um, releasing a broken game does not present with as many financial consequences as actually delaying a game and making it better. The thing is, is that delaying a game presents with more financial consequences than actually releasing a broken product. I, I know it sounds absurd to you, Bacall, but that's just the nature of finance right there when it comes to development of a product. So I'm guessing, uh, despite the fact that they knew they were going to release a, a broken product, I imagine the uh, financial consequences weren't as extreme because, believe it or not, the customer has no input. Just because you're giving money to the developer does not mean that your money has more value. I mean, the, the, the money that actually is valued a lot more to game developers is the money that they get from stockholders. Like, releasing the game on the designated release date allows them to keep their stockholders, and if they have to delay the product, then they most likely lose stockholders in the process. So that's why um, most of the time developers sacrifice the actual quality of their game to release a broken product. That is the un unfortunate reality of the situation, Bacall. I mean, well, Ubisoft also, it's kind of also their fault for fucking releasing an Assassin's Creed game every single year from like 2009 to like 2015. And I guess it's another problem as well that they tried to release Assassin's Creed Rogue alongside Unity. So two Assassin's Creed games were in development. Well, and... Rogue was also a separate team. But Unity it... was like Montreal and Rogue was like Sofia or something. Yeah, but because of the fact that they separated out their teams like that, they couldn't get the full brunt of their workforce to work on Unity. You know? That's also kind of what happened with Xenoblade 2. They had to like have like half their team leave to go help with like Zelda Breath of the Wild. And they only had like a team of like 40 to 60 people and like only three of those people were programmers. Yeah, but you said that uh, Xenoblade 2's development team was not much. So they actually uh, didn't have a lot of conflicts with each other because of the fact that their team was small. Yeah. Yeah. But I've been uh, thinking about doing a series where uh, you introduce me to Xenoblade 2 and I just give my reaction to it and maybe I, uh, you know, well, understand. Well, I did send you that one video before. Yeah, but, um, you know, I think it'd be very interesting to do a video series on that. Because Xenoblade 2 is a very unusual format for me to be indulged in because I don't indulge in that kind of combat format for uh, a game, you know? It's an RPG that plays like an MMO. <laughs> yeah. But hey, I, I think it's an it would be an interesting experience for me. Here we'll be. Actually, rant to someone about all my stupid knowledge that I have in my goddamn fucking fat ass head. I mean, you were already doing that when we were doing our uh, let's shit on new Capcom when discussing the knives out challenge for Resident Evil Village, because we talked a lot about Xenoblade in our uh, Castle Dumbitresk video. <laughs> yeah. Some you actually knew nothing. Yeah, but um, it was definitely great insight to really like highlight a lot of the underlying issues with Resident Evil Village's just, development team. I was just talking about Xenoblade 2 with like, and you had like no context at all about what the fuck I was talking about. Yeah, but at least allowed us to uh, add some commentary to uh, empty space, you know? 
there was no like negative space as a result of that because I was asking a lot of questions about Xenoblade. But um, we're nearing the end of this video, and it'll end at the part where we head straight to to Florence. And I'll reserve that for its own separate video, but I'm just taking the time to uh, renovate some things right here. But uh, you get a lot of money from uh, these renovations. It's just a I... shame that you have to uh, go back to Monte Regione to collect your money. Yeah, I always do like bank and then like the shops first. But uh, we're being introduced to the uh, Assassin Seals. So this is another side mission that uh, you can partake in, even though it is canon to the main story. And I only do this side mission to do the glitch involving the infinite archers because for whatever reason, when you collect Altair's armor and you fast travel to the Dosodoro district of Venice, the every single soldier on the ground is turned off. Like their AI is completely turned off. They don't react to you, but for whatever reason, the archers aren't the same. And I'm guessing the way the glitch works is because the archers are a completely separate entity compared to every other soldier on the ground, because you are technically uh, turning them into normal soldiers when you're close to them, uh, the moment they detect you, because they get turned into normal soldiers, that same bugged programming also applies to them, and therefore it keeps respawning archers in that same spot because of that other problem I was uh, talking about. And that's why you get infinite archers like crazy. And I'll definitely do it in this video when I get the chance. I think you can do it in Brotherhood too, because it runs on the same engine, but I don't, I don't know how to do it in Brotherhood. I don't think it works as well. Yeah, I know there is something like that, but it's with the ground guards, not really so much with the archers. But it just happens randomly out of nowhere. I know this same glitch also happens in Revelations as well. Like the mission where you assassinate a Tarek Barletti and you're and then you have to escape. You can deal with so many Genesetes patrolling. Or maybe what that guy was doing in this video is he escaped combat and a lot of the guards are just uh, walking right near him. So it gave the impression that he managed to duplicate them. Because you can get infinite Genesetes when you're trying to escape from their barracks. And it's a good way to farm money as well. Do that. Yeah, you can just uh, repeatedly kill them as long as you're staying within the uh, the area you're supposed to escape from. And uh, it is very helpful, so it's a pretty good place to farm for money in case you need it. But uh, this is where we're going to conclude the uh, commentary right now. But it is great to be back into the series right now and just talk about shit. Yeah. And yeah, we'll be uh, dealing with uh, Francesco Di Pazzi in the next part of this uh, video series. Thank you guys for watching, and you take care now. You're watching a good game and not a shit game like Valhalla. Definitely. See you all.